I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And, and this, this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Club. The podcast where we take a fresh fall of snow and sharpen it into a spiky, spiky icicle so that you get just the cold, hard, sharp details and none of that junk that you're going to trip over. It's not going to turn into slush on your shoe, baby. Can I say, although that feels completely unprovoked, that was an apt metaphor. <laughs> That like does work. It was cohesive from top to bottom. So very good. I'm always going somewhere coherent. No, I just don't <laughs> not really. And that is all to say that if this podcast is not your cup of tea, we implore you to just find different tea. But if you love us, Ashley will be thanking all of our five star reviewers at the end of the podcast. And I also would like to thank Newly. Thanks to Newly for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Go to newly.com and enter the code WORM20 for $20 off your first month of clothing rental. N-U-U-L-Y dot com and use code WORM20. Speaking of going places, doing things, we last week announced that we will be going places. So if you guys are in any of those cities, Seattle, Portland, Dallas, Austin, Los Angeles, and New York, I hope you come see us. Also, we're doing a live digital show on December 6th with Moment. And we will be donating all the proceeds to the Brooklyn Book Bodega and matching the proceeds. Yeah, I don't know if that came across last time, but I really want to emphasize that the Brooklyn Book Bodega is like our charity of choice. It works locally to us. I understand not everyone lives in Brooklyn, but it gets books into homes that otherwise might not have books and helps them build libraries for their children. It means a lot to us and we will be matching literally every dollar. And I'm excited about it. And another thing. And another thing. And another thing. We also released new merch last week people are loving it it is my favorite merch drop yet adrian hello adrian did an incredible job designing it and ashley did an incredible job sourcing beautiful comfy cozy clothes the tanks have been highlighted as some excellent tank tops that you would just wear and then the sweatshirts are so comfy cozy everything is great everything is comfy cozy we have got another item or two on the way just in time for the holidays i love merch you guys i live for merch and we'll be doing pre-sale capsule merch drops every couple months because we feel like that's a more efficient way to do things. Yeah, and it's more effective for being able to have the softest, comfy, coziest items. Yeah, the quality control is there. Yes. Claire, Mm -hmm. speaking of quality, yeah, if you were writing a memoir, what would you title the chapter about last week? Okay, highs and lows. Highs were the New York City Comedy Fest show. It was so fun. It was amazing meeting you guys. I just want to thank everybody who like waits and meets us. I love chatting with you. I love getting to know you. I love matching an avatar to a person. Highs were I did get a pre-sale to Taylor. Woohoo, me too. <laughs> but because I got one, you got one. Yeah. Um, it wasn't me. It was Mac, which is very fitting. Of course, Mac would get one. Lowe's where we got pretty shitty tickets. <laughs> I will say, looking back, I guess I should have used Mac's like supercomputer. But I can't think about it. I can't. can't do you know what? I feel it. very like it is what it is, and none of it's dire. I've never been to a concert in my life. Why would I deserve floor tickets? That's insane. And also, something I'm learning about myself that I think the Taylor tickets really illuminated. And you guys may have already known at home from my rug and bench debacle. When I hyperfixate on something. There is no limit to what I will do. Numbers lose meaning. Time loses meaning. Everything loses meaning. And I am just like, whatever it takes, mortgage the house, sell a child, kill my kin. I don't care. (laughs) And I think it's almost good that I wasn't able to buy better tickets because in that moment, I would have gone on StubHub and spent it all because I just become so myopic and insane. But I would have been like, go without eating, go without rent. I don't care. I'm glad we didn't do that because you did say that a couple of times. You kept on texting the group being like, I'm prepared to send Mac to the top. (laughs) (laughs) I really was like, double it, double it, double. I don't know. I just like lose my mind. And I I hope we never end up in Vegas. Now that I know that about myself, I think I can come better protected. And I think the wedding is going to be a crisis. (laughs) I do think it'll bankrupt me because I don't know what numbers mean, but it's okay because life is about learning about yourself. Then you can better protect yourself from yourself. Do you guys know when you're browsing on Zillow and you're looking at houses and you're just like, Okay, these are all kind of nice. I'm looking at houses that are $400,000, but if I'm looking at $400,000, I might as well send my range up to $600,000. And then once you're looking at $600,000, like, well, I might as well see what a million dollars gets you in this neighborhood. And then you're in Soho, like four bedrooms for $8 million is actually a steal. And it would be stupid not to buy this because like, you'll never get a deal like this again. (laughs) (laughs) Ashley. Yes, Claire. If you were a celebrity and you were writing a memoir, what would last week's book be called? Uh, Chapter, whatever. Last week's chapter would be called, what's there to worry about? 
Because mm-hmm. I, I think I've used let go and let God before. But you know when there's a lot going on, I get anxiety dreams and I wake up in the middle of the night in a panic, just worried about everything going wrong. And I'm worried about whether or not everyone will like what we're doing. This week was a really big week. We had live shows. We announced more live shows. We dropped merch. It was all stuff that we've been working really, really hard on. Every podcast episode, I used to wake up every Monday night in a cold sweat being like, I hope people like tomorrow's podcast episode. Every and week, I, I used to say to Mac, this is the worst <laughs> episode we've ever done. Everyone's going to stop listening today. And he'd be like, OK, I don't think that's true. <laughs> and I feel like I just have to be like, OK, you worked hard on something. You have to trust that people will like that. And so I need to either just get used to it or choose a different career path. <laughs> Man, I really hope you don't choose a different career path. (laughs) Oh, my God. Speaking of whether or not people like you and your whole career, depending on it, I guess that's every celebrity now. But this really is true for this week's celebrity memoirist, Kelly Ripa, who brought us Live Wire. Can I say this might be the most apt title we've ever I don't even I was just about to say this is the most apt caption I've ever read long-winded short stories that is exactly what these are the longest winded short she tells stories. about 12 random tales from her life that she spans out to be 20 pages long and you're like how because nothing <clears throat> happened here but she'll like do it she writes the way a bubbly person at a party talks with like and another thing oh my god and then you will not believe and you know me Whenever I'm digging through my purse and I can never find anything. And then you're like, oh, what is that? A credit card? Oh, what is that? A lipstick? I didn't even know I had this lipstick still. Why would I even buy this color? Anyway, I was digging through. I can never match my color tone. I'm always thinking like, what color <laughs> lipstick works for me? It doesn't make any sense. They say you should match it to your nipple. Have you heard that? Okay. Anyway, anyway, what was I talking about? What was I looking for in my purse again? Oh my God. The highlighter. The highlighter that I was looking for. You will never believe it exploded. And then she writes it all down. That's like an actually perfect impression <laughs> of a Kelly Ripa story. And I think it translates incredibly on air. And I think for what she does, she's great at it. It is an interesting book in that it's not interesting. It's not interesting, but there's a lot there. I'd say different than Tamara Maori. She wasn't hiding anything. She was giving you as much as she could, but there's enough to dig into. She gives you, I think, what she has. That is who she is as a person. Is someone who like brings you the bubbly fun story. And that's it. This is an interesting book because it's the book of somebody who is unhappy and doesn't know why and can't explain it and won't look for it but it's there (laughs) so let's dig in live wire by kelly ripa kelly ripa was born october 2nd 1970 in south jersey as she will tell us in one of the weirdest most random unimportant chapters i've ever read in the history of this podcast Anyway, so she writes this introduction where she introduces the book. She makes it all very clear right up front that this is a book of essays, not an official memoir, which she doesn't really know the difference. I still kind of don't know the difference. So I think the difference is is chronology. That okay. you, when you don't, when you write a book of essays, you can very easily skip entire swaths of your life that you don't want to get into. Yeah. Whereas in a memoir, you can't skip years 15 through 30 unless you're Tamara Maori. <laughs> so in this introduction, she introduces that it is, in fact, a book of essays and not a memoir, that she is entirely writing it herself. There are a lot of things that she'll point out in this book that she does the hard way because she didn't know that everyone does it the easy way. There are a lot of things where she's like, I didn't know everyone was doing that except me. Like Botox, baby nurses, all these different things where she's like, everyone else, I thought we were all struggling along and it turns out they were all doing something completely different. And it's like, Kelly, who do you talk to? (laughs) So the big conflict in the introduction is that she was getting ready to announce this book. She's always very nervous to promote herself. She gets very anxious about putting herself in the hot seat. But she was like, okay, on my show where I help promote other people, I have to talk about myself this week. I'm going to announce my book. And then they find out that Prince Harry is announcing his book the same day. And she's like, what am I going to do? How can we can't just announce two books? No one's ever had two books. And then they don't push the announcement. They do do it. I did not know that Bill Clinton co-wrote two books with James Patterson called The President is Missing and The President's Daughter. I can't believe that Bill Clinton in his retirement was like, what do I want to put my name to? And he's like, I know a bottom of the barrel thriller. That's so weird to me. Like what if Bill Clinton was directing, quote unquote, directing a straight to home DVD? I guess to me, that's the most relatable post-presidentship I've ever seen. I'm just like, yeah, what if I made Lifetime movies? That's fun. Speaking tours, engagements, that's hard. So she's there and she's like, I'm writing the book myself. And James and Bill cannot freaking believe it they're like you're not using a ghostwriter and she's like no 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 no. and then she's like wait are other people using ghostwriters oh should i have used a ghostwriter this is actually so hard side note i know this has been a lot of side notes but i feel like (laughs) i'm doing this podcast in the style of kelly ripa we have it on good authority that matthew perry did use a ghostwriter 
and he keeps claiming he didn't but for some reason he like just did and I don't know if he genuinely forgot that he used a ghostwriter maybe he thinks writing a book is like saying stuff into a telephone to a person yeah I believe that Kelly Ripa did not use a ghostwriter so she truly did write this herself and you can feel it you can tell anyway on the day that both her and Prince Harry are set to uh, announce their book a rocket ship goes up and it looks like a penis and she's like anyway it really was a weird turn when suddenly she was talking about Blue Origin, the Amazon penis ship. And I was like, what does this have to do with anything? Even though it wasn't my first penis in the morning, I was still in awe. She and Mark Consuelos, fuck. And sh- you're going to know about it. So that's the intro of this book. The announcement got muddled, but here we are still reading it. So then we start with chapter one, Much Ado About Imposter Syndrome. And this is one of the odder chapters I've ever read in my life. And it really goes all over the place. So we're going to try to describe it for you. It starts with Mark and I had found ourselves in that familiar territory of trying to find something to talk about during one of our least favorite activities, sitting in traffic on the Long Island Expressway. So something about this book that I think she was not able to figure out, but she does her best is I think. Her persona is the most relatable woman on TV. However, she is incredibly not relatable. We are talking about somebody who makes $20 million from their day job. Right. Who on top of that has other engagements, who is incredibly famous. She's always, I think, the least famous person in a room full of A-listers. Like, I think that she gets invited to the biggest events, but she's the least famous person at a big event, but she would be the most famous person at a small event, but she isn't at those small events. Like, she's at the White House Correspondents' Dinner and the Oscars and all these things. So she then is like, you know, when you're stuck in traffic coming back from your Hamptons house. She keeps on calling it her house in Long Island. Which is what people call it if you have a house there. My favorite thing rich people do is when they understate what the truth is to make you feel more comfortable. But in doing so, they are clearly saying, I feel so uncomfortable with how much better I am than you that I don't even want to make you feel awkward about it. Like you can just say you have a house in the Hamptons and nobody cares. But to be like, oh, my house in Long Island. Uh, What part in the Long Island? I guess it's like. Southampton. Yeah, just say that, dude. I didn't think you were better than me. You don't have to hide that about yourself. Yeah, I'm realizing more and more, not to bring up Matthew Perry again, but that thing where he has his issue where he's like, trust me, trust me, trust me. You don't want to be famous. Everyone has that thing that they think is the most important thing that everyone else is jealous of them for not having. And it's never really the case. A super rich person who has a house in the Hamptons. He's like, I'm so sorry. I have a house in the Hamptons. It's like, I wouldn't want one. So it's fine. A good example is when people who went I to Harvard. traffic. <laughs> a good example is when people who went to Harvard say they went to school in Boston and you're like, well, you could have just said Harvard, but now you've made this weird like runaround where I have to get it out of you. And your embarrassment of having to admit to me, a lowly person who did not go to Harvard, that you went to Harvard, belies that you think you're a lot better than me. <laughs> so they're stuck in traffic on the LIE, trying to figure out what to talk about. And they're bickering about whose fault it is that they left so late. Is it her fault because she went to a double soul cycle class? Is it his fault because he spent the whole weekend biking a normal bike route? Is it his fault because he's the one who wanted to live in the Hamptons as opposed to the Jersey Shore, which I'm calling bullshit. I do not believe they would have lived in the Jersey Shore by any chance. I feel like they really are part of that Long Island Hampton scene deep entrenched. They love an Andy Cohen. They love a Sarah yes. Jessica Parker. And also, one of the weird things about this book is she has to pretend that Mark is more successful than her, even though he just simply is not. And I'm like, if you wanted to live in Jersey, I think it was all of your money anyway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think you could have lived in Jersey. Yeah. And then she like goes on and on about how there's other people who take helicopters home from the Hamptons and why can't they take helicopters home from the Hamptons and all these other people who are taking helicopters home from the Hamptons don't even have jobs. Me reminding Mark that just because one complains about the Sunday evening gridlock does not mean that one wants to be married to some miserable asshole's more miserable husband. Then he threw down my least favorite gauntlet and exclaimed that I had three healthy kids and a husband who loved me and I should be grateful. Then she gives him the silent treatment and she's like, I wasn't hurting him with my silent treatment. It was a reward. He loves when I'm silent, ah, which is like one of my least favorite things. I fucking hate when women are like, damn it, I was giving him exactly what he wanted. No me. And it's like, why are you married to someone who hates talking to you? <laughs> and then she's like, I wonder if Jay-Z and Beyonce are ever trapped in traffic. And I'm like, I actually think no. I actually definitely think they take helicopters everywhere. This whole wind up where she's just bickering with her husband just out of nowhere is to tell a story where then one of her kids from the back seat brings up that they have heard of imposter syndrome. And so then her and Mark start talking about imposter syndrome. And he's like, how do you not know what that is? And she's like, I don't know. I've just never heard of it. And he's like, well, do you have it? And she was like, no, not at all. I think I'm overly competent. And he was like, that is fucking weird. And I'm like, that is fucking weird. (laughs) I think more women shouldn't have imposter syndrome, but I've just never heard of it like this. She goes, you're missing the point. I know I could if I tried, I think. Don't you remember when we watched the Olympics last winter? How fast did I learn Sasha Cohen's routine? Routine? What routine? You moved all the furniture in the living room and slid around the hardwood floor in your socks screaming triple cow. Proof I was dealing with an amateur. 
First of all, it's called triple sow cow. And any pro athlete will tell you that it's harder to do in socks. And then she ends the chapter being like, I guess sometimes I do have imposter syndrome because this book made me have imposter syndrome. And it's like, OK, I for most of this book thought she hated Mark. It took me a while to be like, oh, no, they have, I think, a pretty solid relationship. Because in order to like shoehorn relatability into her $20 million a year salary life, she throws in all these things where she's like, we bicker like regular people in traffic. We do double soul cycle like regular people in the Hamptons. And you're like, what are you talking about, Kelly? (laughs) I find it interesting that she opens this book by being like, I think I can do anything and I've never felt like an imposter. And she talks about when she learned to be an actress and she's just like, I think it's better to learn on the fly. Isn't that how everybody learns? It's way quicker to learn things as you get there. Why would you ever study before you got there? And then she also goes into all these offshoots about how when they had kids, there weren't any tablets or devices. They just had to walk their kid around the block at the restaurant. She's very regular. And I think if I met her at a dinner party, I would love her. And these stories read like how somebody effervescent and bubbly and just so likable and charming would talk to you at a dinner party. I guess they need to be coming out of the face of someone effervescent because reading them off of a page, you're like, why are you saying this? The thing is, these aren't essays. They are long-winded short stories. And they're not even short stories like fiction short stories. They're just a funny story that you would tell at a dinner party. These are dinner party stories. But something about the gravitas of a book, it should mean more. And it is very interesting to start your book by being like, I never heard of imposter syndrome. Turns out I don't have it. I actually feel pretty confident. And you're like, okay, great. Well, cool. (laughs) And if she'd had a ghostwriter or an Anyone helping her write this book, I think they would have dove into like what that means to operate as a woman in society, like feeling like you belong there. Well, I guess I wonder why was this the opening essay? Yeah. I guess she's like, here's my personality. My personality is I think I can do anything. Except sometimes I don't. Yeah. I just think I would have framed it differently. And then the way that it very clunkily ends on. And then I wrote this book and I realized, actually, maybe I do have imposter syndrome. And I'm like, actually, imposter syndrome is reverse. You wrote a book having never written anything before. Imposter syndrome would have been like if this was your 12th bestseller and you were like, I still don't think I have it in me. (laughs) Yeah. Imposter syndrome is not being like, I'm nervous about this thing I've never done before. That's just good self-awareness. I did not dislike Kelly Ripa. I just am very confused as to what this book was supposed to accomplish. I like her a lot. I wish I met her at a dinner party. That's why I, I really actually enjoyed reading this book. Because it is such a pile of nonsense. It didn't make me angrily go like, what the fuck is this, Kelly? It made me kind of be like, what the fuck is this, Kelly? <laughs> what are we, What are we looking at here? <laughs> She's the kind of person you meet and you have so much fun talking to. And then that night you're going to bed and looking back over the conversation, you're like, oh, was she crazy? <laughs> but I love her. Next chapter, we can't even get into. The whole chapter is about the Garden State and it's about how she's from South Jersey. Which, okay, fine. It has nothing to do with her life. I don't know why she even had to bring it up because she hasn't lived there since the 80s. And then she talks about how no matter where she goes in the world and she describes a couple of lavish vacations, no matter how fancy it is, someone from Jersey will always scream at her from across the room and go, Kelly Ripa, you're from Jersey? (laughs) And so this is another one of the things where she's not relatable. And it's been years. We looked it up. In 2004, her salary was $8 million. So she has been extremely rich for an extremely long time. And even though I think she is the most relatable rich person, I don't think she realizes how out of touch she is because she's doing this whole book about how I'm just like you, no matter where I go, there's somebody saying like, Kelly Ripa, what do you think about the pizza down in South Jersey? But also (laughs) the first essay is about being trapped in traffic on the way back from your Hamptons house. So the second essay is about how no matter how far and elaborate her vacations are, there's always someone from New Jersey there. Goes to She's like, we will be on a remote island. Everything will be custom tile. And still someone will slide across that custom tile to be like, wish they had a Taylor pork roll at this buffet. <laughs> <laughs> but looking back, I was like, Ugh, an interesting way to start your super relatable book. <laughs> but the one line I do want to draw attention to is, so this person's screaming at her. I just want to take a photo. We saw Mark and she was yelling at him, but I don't think he heard us. Yeah, I really wanted Mark's picture, but you're fine too. What are you doing here? I should have said, oh, I'm here in case Mark can't hear whoever wants his picture. And then she's like, everybody always just wants Mark's picture, but they'll settle with me. That is just cannot be true. And listen, I don't want to be fucking screamed at by you people because I know that everyone in the world has this really hard time with if somebody I think is less famous than you think is very famous. Like that's a personal attack on you and your belief system or whatever. I feel comfortable saying that in the grand scheme of things, Kelly Ripa is more famous than Mark Consuelos. I've only ever in my 30 years of being on this planet... Heard of Mark Consuelos as Kelly Ripa's husband. I knew they met on a daytime talk show and I thought that was the last gig he ever got. 
I guess now he's on Riverdale, so he's having a bit of a comeback. But I still think Live with Regis and Kelly is a bigger show because Kelly is in the title. Here's the thing is I think Mark Consuelos has been in a lot of things. I think if you're following Mark Consuelos, you see Mark Consuelos everywhere. But Kelly Ripa permeates pop culture. Yes. She is a part of everything. You can turn on any TV on the planet at any given moment and probably find Kelly Ripa. The Regis and Kelly show, the Regis and Kathy show, the Kelly and Ryan show, these are iconic parts of pop culture. I'm sorry, but Kelly Ripa is more famous than Mark. She must know that she makes a shit ton more money than him. They must see the numbers. They must know. And she's consistently made more money than him every year for the last 25 years. But this weird game that she plays in this book where the entire time she pretends that everybody wants Mark. Mark is more famous. Mark is the one with the career potential because that's a joke she'll make down the line is like, I can't wait for a Mark's TV show to take off so we can, I can finally retire. I think you can retire, Kelly. I imagine you've stored some of that cash away, that $20 million a year that you're now making. You haven't put any of that into savings. So I don't know if that's to belittle herself because she's trying to seem relatable or if that's like a through line in their marriage that she has to constantly pretend that he's the one with promise and he's the talented one to like keep things copacetic. I will also say though, I think if you know Mark Consuelos, you love Mark Consuelos. I was just going to say he would never come out with a memoir, but I think if he did, there'd be more intrigue. Whereas Kelly Ripa is this presence that permeates anything, but I can't imagine who a devoted Kelly Ripa fan base is. Whereas I think if you like Mark, you love Mark. Right. So maybe that's why people want pictures with Mark. Yeah. He's niche. Like if I saw Kelly Ripa, I would never go up to her and say, can I have a photo of you? Whereas there's less famous people where I'd be like, oh my God, can I get a photo with you? Yeah. But if I saw them walking down the street, I would be like, oh, my God, that is Kelly Ripa. Who's the man? That's a hot man, though. (laughs) So this next chapter is called Scenes from a Real Marriage. And this is the story of how she and Mark Consuelos got together. It's pretty raw and real, I guess. It's (laughs) everything she says starts so incoherently. I've never slept with a 50-year-old man. Actually, I suppose I will have by the time this book comes out. Wait, now that I think about it, by the time this book comes out, I'll probably be sleeping with a man nearly in his mid-50s. 52 is close enough. Mark, of course, has slept with a 50-year-old woman plenty of times. I'm assuming I'm the only 50-year-old, but you know what they say about assuming. So this is about how she's like six months older than Mark. And that's all just to lead up to how they met and how they got married. They met on All My Children. He was brought in to screen test as like a love interest for her character. She looked ugly the day that he was being shown the studio. I have to call out a line. And okay, it sounds like I'm shitting on her. I actually really, really like her. But I do think when you have a book that has no point, you kind of leave yourself open to being picked apart because I have to find something interesting to say about this. And these are just stories that are only interesting coming out of her mouth. One of the things she does that I'm like, okay, you're so out of touch. And she talks about how when they met, she had toothpaste on a cystic pimple that she had that day. And she's like, it's because I had tried every other method to get rid of it. And all that was left was to use toothpaste. And she goes, why I didn't call a dermatologist is still a question I ask myself to this day. And I'm like, you didn't call a dermatologist because people don't call a dermatologist for a single pimple unless you are Taylor Swift. Anyway, so she's walking around set. Her hair is in curlers. She has toothpaste on her pimple and she meets Mark and she's like, that guy's hot. The next day they screen test and she's like, I don't even care who else screen tested. It was him. And then they're working together. They start dating secretly. They break up because he thought she cheated on him. She went home to South Jersey. And when she got back, he assumed she had cheated with her ex. And so then he broke up with her. They got back together because they had to do a talk show or something together. Live with Regis and Kelly. Oh, my God. Well, at the time, live with Regis and Kathy. They had both agreed to do some Mother's Day episode where they were going to roll out a lazy boy for a special mother in the audience who was obsessed with their characters. Their characters were dating on the show, All My Children. It was Haley and whatever somebody. Who cares? So they're in the waiting room and he misses her. He uses the opening to talk to her. They end up going back to his apartment, having an entire pizza, she claims, and also, having sex and falling in love. She's like, I knew I was going to see him that day. So I wanted to look extra beautiful, but I'd been up all night crying. So she tries to do like a witch hazel ice bath to calm her puffy face. And she doesn't have witch hazel. She just has rubbing alcohol. So she dunks her head in rubbing alcohol. And she's like, anyway, I still looked really good. So I guess the rubbing alcohol thing worked. And I was like, what are you talking about? You just like chemical peeled your head off. (laughs) Well, that works. Yeah, they see each other. They go for lunch after their appearance. They end up having sex all day and then they decide to like fly to Vegas and elope. She's like, how many other couples do you know broke up five days before they got married? And it's like, honestly, probably a handful, but I bet none of them are willing to admit it in a book. 
<laughs> so they broke up. She says they're playing chicken where he's like, I love you so much. And she's like, well, how much? He's like, enough to marry me. And it's like, okay, prove it. So then they go to Vegas and she says on the way back, they're just looking at each other like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, we did it. And they had these disposable photos of each other on the plane back just looking. She said they both looked despondent. <laughs> we were both terrified. We eloped, but too stubborn to admit to each other that we made a mistake. Again, the look on his face is a man figuring out how to get out of the mess he'd gotten himself into. He took a picture of me on the plane as well. I was reading an unauthorized biography about Grace Kelly as one does. And I too look, how should I put this? Not thrilled. I do think the thing that I get from this book is that they have a marriage that they've chosen to continue. And I mean that in a good way. I'm also very interested in the day to days of the relationship because on the one hand, I feel like they spend a lot of time together. But on the other hand, he is still a working actor and it seems like he's gone for months at a time. And she's incredibly busy. I wonder how often they actually see each other. Yeah. I mean, she talks about how they rushed into it, how they had this moment of that, like blaming each other. This marriage is your fault. I don't think a marriage should be anyone's fault. Well, I get that at that point they were like, oh, we made a big yeah. decision, but they stuck with it. Marriage is work and making a long term marriage last takes a special kind of patience, understanding and work ethic. It also requires bravery. Any two people in a long-term relationship will tell you that it's not for the faint of heart. Marriage is for warriors. Sometimes you might have to go to war, not just with each other, but sometimes you have to go to war for each other. Sometimes you might be called upon to do a one-person UN peace accord. But before you throw the towel in, look at your person, look at the person you chose. Try to see them with the same eyes when you first saw them. Try to imagine what brought you together in the first place. I know that in the thick of whatever it is a couple might be in the thick of, it's easier said than done, but try. She also talks about how when she met him, he had a light up bed and I really would love to see a picture. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I also want to read this other part because I think this is very interesting about the way relationships work today because I think we hear a lot about the way there's this paralysis of choice and people are unable to like be in committed relationships because you have just a deck of people as soon as you download a dating app just waiting for you in your phone that you can talk to. You can go on Instagram and slide into someone's DMs. There are so many opportunities to look for the next best thing. But this is another thing that I think I haven't really thought about. She talks about after they got into that fight and broke up a couple days before they ended up eloping. He told me he was sorry. He told me that he loved and missed me. He asked for my forgiveness. And since I didn't have a smartphone and couldn't run it by my support committee, I forgave him. I wonder how much of our relationship decision making has been outsourced to the gang. Or even she says like sitting in that waiting room for the Regis and Kathy Lee appearance. They had to just look at one another because there was nothing else to look at. And I do agree that it's harder to distract yourself. Yeah. You're like, well, we have to have a conversation. And because we had to have a conversation, we ended up forgiving each other. And then because I couldn't be like, well, let me think on it. And let me text every person I've ever met to be like, what would you do in this situation? She had to follow her heart, which clearly was with him. But I don't know. I think that when you've been in this hot and heavy relationship, it's probably very easy to have one friend who's like, never trust him. And then you'd be like, well, I have to listen to them. They're my best friend. I have to say as that best friend, nobody listens to me. Nobody's <laughs> ever listened to that one friend. I think we can all agree listening that nobody has ever listened to the group of friends being like, don't meet up with him tonight. He literally is dating your cousin. <laughs> and you're like, OK. And then you're like, what did you do last night? And you're like, I just he, he had a sock of mine. I had to go back. <laughs> anyway. People gamble in Vegas all the time. That city in the desert grew from the tears of broken dreams, lost fortunes, quick weddings, and even quicker divorces. It wasn't supposed to work out. We weren't supposed to work out. On paper, couples like us do not work out. As I reread these words, I think these two people should not have made it. They were immature. They met on a, the set of a soap opera. She rambled like a crazy person, convinced immediately that they were destined for one another. In the photos, in the days right after our secret wedding, we both looked like we were smelling something bad. Does that sound like a couple that will go the distance? But for some reason, we did. I mean, for now, we have. It's like, I don't know. In some ways, it does sound like a couple that will go the distance. Can I say what's very interesting? She has the exact opposite experience of Tamara, where Tamara was like, there was no spark, but we just worked at it. And then Kelly is like, the minute I saw his headshot, I thought he will be my husband. I have to make this work. They were all spark. This book is literally dedicated for Mark, the keeper of the spark. Something that I do think is funny is she's like, listen, the way he gives that D. I wish everyone in the world could have an experience having sex with my husband just so they can know what good sex is. I do think it keeps them together. Me too. But I also think it has to start with a spark and then you work at the rest. thing that felt so loveless about Tamara's and some of the other relationships we've read about when people are just like, well, I wasn't sure, but he was there. I'm like, that is not it. So this next chapter, don't let your husband pick your death clothes is our favorite 
brand of chapter. Every magazine who wrote about this book, this is the only chapter they read. They read one sentence from this chapter and they just ran with it. This is the chapter where she talks about passing out whilst boinking. It starts obviously with like a nonsense story about when you call 911. Yeah, I guess she watches a lot of Dateline and it's like on Dateline, the kids are always calling 911 and my kids wouldn't know to call 911. They'd call Uber Eats and get themselves dinner as I lay dying. And I'm like, like it, that would be a funny thing to say at a dinner party, but it is an, a nonsensical way to start this chapter. So then she talks about how her and Mark have a lot of sex. So she's nursing her first child. She feels like shit. She looks like shit. But he... <laughs> <laughs> it's unconfirmed that she looks like shit that's how she feels and that's what she says she looks like she describes herself looking like shit she says she's been wearing the same shirt for days and days because it was her favorite nursing shirt I'm still wearing Mark's old threadbare t-shirt that I used for nursing because it was so comfortable and smelled of milk and baby I'm not going to pretend it was a chore I love having sex with Mark he should teach a class in love making I'm convinced that the divorce rate would plummet if he taught other men how to be mindful lovers and she talks about how all of her friends are satisfied and she's like I feel guilty sometimes hanging out with them being like I come <laughs> <laughs> but you know she's feeling bad after her first baby she's not comfortable in her body and then she had her first baby at 27 and I think because they were both actors that's kind of young for New York City she didn't have any friends that had babies and it was pre-internet so everything that you could learn was from a book and she felt very just ill-equipped to know about what was going through her body what was normal what the common experience was and she's like one of the things nobody told me about having a baby is breastfeeding can like stop you from getting wet so she was about like very dry all yeah. over yeah so she's not super in the mood her baby is napping she's like maybe we could take a nap and then mark is like but what if we wink wink and she's like okay so they start having sex and then she passes out from pain she wakes up strapped to a gurney he had gotten her dressed in an insane outfit a leotard <laughs> And like snap up pants like a soccer player would wear. And she does very astutely ask the question, how did he get me into a leotard? I will say that is the last thing I would pick for a passed out person. That is the most complicated outfit you could put on a woman. Did he snap up each individual snap? Like what was happening? What was happening? She's in snap pants and a leotard being wheeled to the hospital. She can't believe what's happening. It turns out she has ovarian cysts. And one of them burst. And that was the sharp pain. And of course, she's humiliated because she says her OBGYN comes and checks on her. And she's like, how did you know I was here? And he was like, over the PA system, they said woman comes in after passing out, having sex with her husband. And she's like, they said that on the PA system? <laughs> He's like, so we all just came to look. And it turns out it was you. So they're in the doctor. She's told that she has ovarian cysts, that they're just kind of there for the most part. And she's like, well, what if one pops again? What do I do? And Mark is like panicking in the corner because he doesn't like hospitals. And he says, when can we have sex again? And she's kind of freaking out because she's like, we just don't have to. She keeps on having to caveat, but I do like having sex with him. He's so good at sex and he's so hot. Yeah, right now, while you're healing from giving birth, you don't have to explain why you don't want to have sex with your husband. I believe you and I think that it's fine. He sees the look on her face and he says, you know what? Let's wait a couple weeks. Well, the doctor <laughs> says you can have sex tonight you're fine. And in six weeks, we'll check you again to see how all the fluid is flushing out. And she is just like, please, please, shouldn't we wait six weeks then to make sure the fluid flushes? And Mark looks over and looks at her and says, maybe we'll wait six weeks. And she starts weeping with joy and exhaustion and emotion. I will stare at this man. He looks at me and smiles. He was the one listening to my psychic conversation. He is bearing witness to the difficulty I'm having finding my way back to being his wife and lover while also being a new mother and working full time. He is so young and I often worry that I've asked too much of him. What 27 year old man wants to be married? And now we are married with a child which ratches up the stress by 2 million percent and apparently my age by 40 years. And here he is standing with the resolve of a man twice his age and yet still half of mine and with the wisdom of someone who has a PhD in women's studies. So then he's like, it's going to be okay. And they're hugging and they're kissing in the hospital and then they go home. And they bang it out because yeah. she's so grateful. She's so grateful that he's not insistent upon having sex that she's like really horny for him. And the thing with this chapter is I feel like they have a good relationship. I think that it seems like they love each other a lot. They're very attracted to each other. They're very into each other to this day. But I wish there had been like notes of like, you shouldn't feel afraid to tell your husband these things. I do think at the time that they were so young at 27. I agree, but like reflecting back upon it, I don't feel like we have that. She's not writing this from the age 27. She's writing this in her 50s. 
I guess I think there didn't need to be that much reflection because it worked out. If they had gone home and had sex and she would have been like, I wish now I just said I don't feel well, blah, blah, blah. But because it all worked out, yeah. she doesn't need to go back and be like, here's what I learned. Because the lesson was that her husband had her back the whole time. She's like, he knew what I was thinking without me having to say it. He was worried about me and it all was fine. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what lesson is to be learned, but it happened exactly as she wanted it to happen. I feel like the lesson is for other people. In terms of being the most relatable woman on TV or whatever, I kind of think that this story stressed me out because I do think that there are people who like look to her for information and how to be relatable and how to be a good wife. I feel like I want to see it written out, like listen to your body. This chapter just did kind of stress me out of the pressure to have sex with your husband again and like to be hot for your husband again after you've delivered his baby. And I feel like it didn't do that much to like add to that conversation. Nothing in this book adds to any conversation. That's true. (laughs) I guess most of the other chapters don't have any like real world implications for anyone else. No one else is going to be like, how to be relatable on your way back from the Hamptons. (laughs) I guess I just don't know what else there is to ask of her. Yeah, I'm just saying this was not a chapter I liked that much. And the fact that it became the pull quote and it's a chapter about being ready for sex again after a baby. Like, I don't think that there was more to add to it. I'm just saying I think that like out of all of the chapters in this book, that one was one of the more stressful ones to me because it was very much about the pressure to keep having sex and then in that one moment where he listened to her and understood her without her speaking she was like great now we can have sex well I think the whole chapter is predicated on this idea that I am so lucky that I have a husband who doesn't force me to have sex and that feels like a low bar yes that's what it is for her to be like how great is my husband one time I got back from the hospital and he didn't force me to have sex with him upon returning from like a gynecological trauma. I guess. Okay, how so- great is that? And do you think that that is a low bar to be like, how wonderful is my husband? But I still also don't think anybody did anything wrong that it's a bad lesson. Well, that's why I just didn't like the chapter that much is because I'm yeah. like, no one did anything wrong. Nothing wrong happened. But I guess it bummed me out that we're celebrating that Mark didn't make her have sex after she went to the hospital. No, I get I'm that. like, I guess I don't expect a lesson. I don't expect a teachable moment for other people but I am like there's an unspoken okay sense that <laughs> this is something that is amazing as opposed to just par for the course which is I guess it's like one of those things where all of these stories are nonsense but this one I feel like is nonsense that makes me kind of sad because I'm just like yeah yes really great that you have a husband who wanted you to let your body heal no I understand that I do think where she goes wrong in this book because it is just like a bubbly delightful little story of anecdotes is when she tries to get David Sedaris with it. Yeah. And in the small moments, find great meaning. If you look at what all these stories are, they are exactly what we've been saying. Funny cocktail party stories of, oh, you think that's embarrassing. One time we were having sex and I woke up with a leotard on and then they shouted it over the PA system. And then I was the lady who passed out when she had sex with her husband. I don't think she's able to find the greater meaning in any of these stories, but these are all cute, fun stories. But when she tries to make those connections, that's where she falls short. So the next chapter, have you called your mother? This is about her telling her mom that she wants to go to therapy and her mom having the classic, why are you going to spend so much money talking shit about me? And her saying, I'm not going to talk shit about you, but I am. So I think this is a good example of where this book falls short for me, because this is an attempt to explain her childhood and a very complicated relationship she has with her mother, as all relationships with all parents are complicated. It's clear she's upset about her mother. But I think the problem is Kelly Ripa has a loyalty to her family that most writers don't have. So they're not willing to air out all the grievances. In this chapter, she's trying to make you understand that she has like a fucked up childhood and she has all this trauma from how she was raised. But she can't bring herself to say anything valid. So the two stories she gives is that her dad worked double shifts and left at 4 a.m. every morning. And her mom would stay up all night watching TV with Kelly, which is crazy. You should not have a five-year-old staying up till 4 a.m. watching TV with you. But... There's no explanation of what that means or what the larger premise is. And then she says growing up, she watched Cher on TV. And she dreamed that Cher was her mom. And that, you know, she was a handful and her parents were always like, you're a lot, Kelly. You're so much work or whatever. And I'm sure she was, but she doesn't really go deep on anything. And I I feel like it's she wants to be like, you know, you don't understand there's something here, but she can't put her finger on what it is or she's not willing to tell you. So what it ends up being is this whole chapter of like kooky stories that you feel like she's telling with like eyes that don't blink. Like there's a hidden message in here and you're like, okay, but I do not know what the hidden message is. And then it just ends with her saying, now that I have kids, I realize how much she sacrificed for me and I'm so appreciative of her. Perspective is invaluable. What I didn't realize, even when I was raising my own kids, because I was too close to the page to see the full chapters, was that my mom gave me her undivided attention constantly. I needed that. I was that kind of kid. I have three kids and had a lot of help along the way, but I now see how difficult it must have been for her to essentially raise me alone. 
So thank you, mom, for all of your sacrifice. You never got enough credit and I'm giving it to you now. And thank you, Cher, for just being Cher. So I don't know. There's just not a ton here. Yeah. Kelly Ripa is somebody that feels feelings and doesn't know or isn't willing to get to the core of them. So there's a disconnect, I think, between how emphatic she is in telling these stories and why she's telling it to you. Especially in this book where it's a series of emphatic stories where you're like, okay, which are the ones we're supposed to be pulling meaning from and which ones are you just on your way back from Long Island? Because there is one story in here and we'll get to it later. I call it the George Clooney story. (laughs) It's not about George Clooney. It's about a different old guy. Who is it about? Richard Gere. I don't think as a society we need two of them. All hot men over 50 who are white to me are George Clooney. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I can't learn so many lames. That's crazy. You're telling me if Pretty Woman had starred George Clooney, it would have been a different movie? Yes. No. (laughs) What about the parent trap? Who's that guy? Dennis Quaid. Okay. Also could have been He doesn't even George have Clooney. gray hair. But to me, the same. Okay. Effectively the same. I feel like George Clooney has an arrogance and Dennis Quaid and Richard Gere have a softness. I think George could act soft. I don't have, I don't see kind eyes on him. I see mocking eyes. Interesting. <laughs> this is what the book should have been. Just yes. funny little anecdotes from the top as opposed to relatable stories from the middle and I'm just like you I just happen to have a house in the Hamptons and be best friends with people who are billionaires yeah but I'm not different than you and you're like yes you are we are different so this next chapter what's a baby nurse is so relatable it's about how she's working with a producer who is talking about her baby nurse and she's like what is a baby nurse and she keeps on being like what is a baby nurse she spends like four pages talking about how she couldn't comprehend the concept and what these people could possibly be talking about. And it's like, Kelly, think for a second. You can guess what a baby nurse is. You're a rich Upper East Side mom on your third kid. Yeah. You, I, like at some point, I understand when you have your first baby and pre-internet, it's lonely and it's scary. And if you don't have friends who have kids, maybe you're feeling very isolated and don't but know once stuff. But first kid goes to preschool and now you're meeting other moms. That's what I'm saying is, did you not go to a single mom group? There were meetups. I am absolutely sure there were Lamaze classes and meetups and like ways to meet other mothers with your child. And I guess because she was working, she didn't have time. But it does feel like at some point there were ways for you to meet other women who had children your age and find a group and you just chose not to. And now you can't claim ignorance because that was a choice. Yeah, this actually reminds me of (laughs) a young me. A young you. Because I'm trying to get better at it specifically because I feel like there were a lot of things in my life that I did like absolutely the hard way. Now I still have a lot of trouble asking for help, you know that, but I used to not ask anything at all ever and then I would do things the hard way because no one told me that there was an easier way to do it because I never asked and I just thought I knew how to do everything on my own. You can ask people what they did. You're not like stealing information from them. You're not breaking any laws. You can say, hey, when you did this, what was your process like? And it makes shit a lot easier. There are a lot of things in this book that she does absolutely the hard way because she just apparently has never talked to another fucking soul. So what she had instead of a baby nurse was her in-laws. The OG baby nurse. God's baby nurse, if you will. (laughs) And then she talks about what would have happened if she'd had a baby nurse. And she's like, I would have been diagnosed with postpartum depression, I think. But because I wasn't diagnosed, I've moved on. (laughs) And then she goes on and says... I'm not going to talk to you about how hard my pregnancy is because what happened to me won't happen to you. So don't worry about it. And then it goes on to basically talk about giving birth and how hard it was. <laughs> Something went wrong and the baby had a fever and they had to put it in the NICU and she was alone. That sounds so scary because her husband was with the baby in the NICU and she was alone and couldn't go see the baby because they couldn't find a wheelchair for her. And then luckily her friend showed up and was like, I'll find you a wheelchair. And she just like grabbed one out of the hallway and wheeled her to see the baby. And she's like, the minute I held my baby, I forgot everything. And it was so worth it. And I love that baby. And she's like, you need a friend who will come and help you fix shit. Yeah. And I'm like, amen. Amen. So then this chapter where she finds out she is accidentally pregnant with her third child, not accidentally, but unexpectedly. I will say me and Ashley just had to take a half hour break to talk through these two chapters coming up because I was so confused by their order. This first chapter, it's probably just the flu, is the story of how she found out she was pregnant with her third child. And then the next chapter is about the story of how she found out she was pregnant with her second child. Right. So normally you would tell those in the opposite order because you'd say two comes before three. But if you're counting backwards, three actually comes before two and people forget that. Yeah, but the last chapter was about when she had her first baby. Right. So... One, three, two, five, six, five, six, seven. <laughs> See? 
Got it. <laughs> she talks about not realizing that she was pregnant. She was juggling a lot. She was still working at the soap opera and deciding whether or not she was going to renew her contract. She had started working full time at Live with Regis and Kelly. So she would wake up, go to Live with Regis and Kelly and then go do her soap opera at noon all with a five-year-old and a one-year-old. Right. And then her husband took a job where he was filming a movie in Australia for seven months. She's feeling like shit. They want to fly her out to host an event in LA. She's like, I don't want to do it. The event they, is the premiere for Lilo and Stitch, which is, I think, like an, an important film. I agree. It's really important. Bug is a lot like Stitch. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah. And they look alike. Yeah. And, and had also be been a guest on the show many times. He seemed to have no memory on, of ever seeing him be before in his life. I don't know. I kind of think it's like when you dressed right, I bat this year and I was like, okay, she's just Well, herself. look at you. Yeah. He said so, as we began to walk out, just relax and let Regis handle everything, okay? This will be the fastest hour of your life. He pulls out the chair and he goes, I'll pull out the chair for you, okay, sweetheart? He offered in a very paternal way. I found his kindness reassuring. Sure. Um, okay, I, but he interrupted with, save it for the air. Save it for the air, he said twice. And then every single day that we work together going forward. So I guess they had like no personal relationship off of air. Yeah. She makes it sound like every time she tried to speak to him, he'd be like, save it for the air. <laughs> yeah. So they go on, they do the host chat. She looks over at Gelman at one point and then he like taps her on the shoulder and he's like, over here, please. And everyone laughs. And it's like this hilarious moment about when she looked at Gelman. Then the psychic comes on and guesses that she's pregnant. And she's like, okay, everyone thought it was hilarious. Everyone thought she did so well. She had post-it notes on her door when she got back to all my children from all of the major agencies. And I'm like, did you not have an agent? She's worried, of course, that her family all just found out that she was pregnant from TV. And Mark is like, I've already talked to everyone. Nobody's mad at you. But she's just freaking out. She doesn't even think she's going to get the co-hosting job. She's mostly worried about the fallout with her family. She didn't know it was a co-hosting job. So she's just concerned that she has been outed as pregnant on air at eight weeks before she had planned on telling anybody. She's also afraid that she broke the cardinal sin of looking at Gelman. It seems like Regis did not like her at all. And she's just very bamboozled that everyone says congrats when she thinks she did a horrible job. Oh, yeah. She also has to go to her boss at All My Children's office and be like, by the way, I'm pregnant. What if we wrote it in, though? And they're like, no. <laughs> they're like, no, we can't have you be pregnant. Someone else on the show is pregnant. And so then they hide her pregnancy. And then as soon as she gives birth to Lola, they make her character on All My Children pregnant. And she's like, I think I was pregnant for 18 months. So they ask her back to host. Then they ask her to host live with Regis again. She then goes on to keep hosting live with Regis as the guest co-host. She's still under the impression that this is not a job. She believes them. And it seems like she must have been forcing ignorance because they keep taking her out to lunch with like the VP of this, the exec of that. And she's meeting up with the higher and higher, higher up people at ABC and she's claiming that she had no idea that this could be a job for her. And then for a third time, she goes back in. Regis greeted me 45 seconds before the show started with, uh-oh, Gelman, it's got an entourage. It? I felt my face get hot and my heart start racing. I flashed a strained smile but, and said, by it, did you mean me? Then came that familiar reply, save it for the air. Did you really want me to save that for the air? Maybe it was all in my head, but I was certain that the vibe shift from backstage continued on the air all day. Finally, an offer comes in. She's like, what are you talking about? The last time I hosted, they were all so mean to me backstage. She says, um, Angela, I have to tell you, I really don't think they like me over there. I don't think it's a good idea. I have no idea what happened, but something clearly did. And I think you better find someone else, someone he likes. Angela says, it's not his decision to make Kelly. It's not you. So don't take it personally. You are a breath of fresh air that the show needs. I will protect you. Just think about it. Discuss it and let's circle back. Basically, there is a production company and there is the production and they are consistently at odds. So the show started as like a local talk show and then ended up getting syndicated and bought out by another company. But it's, so it's owned essentially by two separate companies, the on the ground production company who started with Regis and then ABC, who actually has all the power. So she says, I wish I had understood the dynamic between the two divisions back then. I would have run, but I didn't. So I didn't. So when she gets this call from her agent that they're offering her the gig, they say they want to make sure you know who your boss is. And she's like, what does that mean? And her agent says, no idea. Good luck. (laughs) So she's talking about this with her husband. And she's like, I don't know what to do because this is obviously good. This is obviously a much better job than working these long hours on a soap opera. So she's sitting there deciding, do I take better hours and more money and more stress? Or do I stick with what I'm doing? Obviously, we know what she chose. But the negotiations were bonkers. She says, I was commanded, yes, commanded to use Regis's hair and makeup team. I pushed back that it made no sense. Go to a second studio, wash my face and hair and have it all redone. But they insisted that it was a deal breaker as live had a very specific look. At that point, we were at a standstill over (coughs) item one, which again is never a good sign, but there was more. She was told that there'd be no wardrobe services or budget, none zero. I know that I sound like a broken record, but this never happens on any show. 
There would be no paid maternity leave, which she's like, that's on brand. And I was also pregnant at the time. So that was stressful. She was told she was not allowed to have an office. Her name had to be smaller than Regis's name on all branding. I mean, there was a lot of very goofy deal points. I will say the hair and makeup and wardrobe thing is batshit crazy. You want a girl out on TV in the clothes she brought from home? That is crazy. Yeah. Rent stuff. So they said... Seniority after all That word Seniority was used quite a bit During that negotiation In my early years on live However it seemed that seniority Would be elusive to me Something that I could never achieve Even when I was the person On the show with the seniority As it turns out Seniority is a masculine word The biggest misconception About my place on the show Was that Regis had hand selected me Guided me And was my best friend And then left After which I never spoke to him again I think that's a basic misconception about on-air personalities in general. The audience assumes that they are watching two best friends. I get it. I used to think that Regis and Kathy Lee were married. Oh my God, what if we're lying? What if we never actually talked off air and every time you tried to talk to me, I said, save it for the air. We do do that sometimes. We call each other 10 times a day. It's sick. (laughs) When I only see you once or twice in a day, I like miss you so much and I call you. (laughs) Anyway, she talks about how hard it was on her when Regis left because everyone dragged her name through the mud. And Regis himself would go on interviews and talk about how she just kind of like left him out to pasture. And it would straight up lie. So one of the things she said that he perpetuated was this idea that they never invited him back to the show. And she's like, we regularly invited him back. He never wanted to come. Something else that he said is that like, I never reached out to him and like, we never reached out to each other and he never tried to call me. And he did not even tell me that he was quitting. I found out on air. Yeah. And she also says he would go on interviews and basically say that he made these women the interviewer said, by the way, all these women who've worked with you and become hugely successful, Mary Hart, Kathy Lee Gifford, Kelly Ripa, you made these women, Regis, made them what they are. And then she writes, for the record, we all had jobs when we were hired. And he didn't even hire her. So the weirdest part is he did come back one time for a Halloween episode, which was weird because he famously hates Halloween. And he went on an air later and said, they've never invited me back to the show. And she's like, he had just done the show. Like, it's just complete lies that we can prove because he had, in fact, one time done the show. And she said when he was on set that day, he walks into her dressing room and goes, hello there, Miss Star. Then Gelman swept in with, you remember Kelly Ripa? I didn't take it personally because as America knows, we had a long-standing joke that he could never remember my name. They were coworkers for what, 15 years? I do feel really bad for her that she constantly ends up the butt of these situations where they're like, oh, Kelly's hard to work with. Kelly's crazy. Kelly is a diva when Regis left. She doesn't mention Michael Strahan once on here. And I'm sure she did freak out when Michael Strahan left because I think that she finally thought maybe she had some seniority around there. And she says in this book, seniority is a masculine term. I had always heard that they hired Michael over her and she was really mad about it because she had put in the time. I mean, that does suck. And I don't think she had a say in searching for Michael's replacement. And I'm pretty sure she found out that Michael was leaving on air as well. And I think that they never, I I think to this day, they don't treat her like she's like an integral part of the team. I think to this day, she's treated like someone who's testing for the show that she's been on for 25 years. The problem is, and I do feel bad for her. It does seem like she's treated like shit. But even in this essay, I'm like, what are you saying exactly? I wish she had said in plain English. And I guess she can because of NDAs. But the way she kind of hints at it, I mean, that whole line about how she never got seniority and then was like, I'm only saying this to clear the air because people think it's my fault and it's not my fault. And it's like, just say what you want to say within legal rights. But also she ends it in such an abrupt way. I learned a lot over the years, mainly that context is almost always overlooked and something repeated often enough becomes the truth. And the good outweighs the bad mostly. And then she talks about how she was able to raise her kids in a very continuous way because she had the same job. She earns a great living. But what sometimes gets twisted is that all of those opportunities exist because of live. And whoever has the great good fortune to ascend to that rare seat behind the host chat desk channels the universe of infinite possibilities, harnessing entirely that spontaneous, electrifying and explosive energy. All while precariously perched atop a live wire. Because that sentence is so fucking confusing to read, I'm like not 100% sure what she's saying. I also think because she's saying it in the negative, it's not very clear. So this is something that you and I are both very confused about after finishing this book is what does she want? Like what were her career goals? Because I know she feels slighted by live, but like it doesn't feel like live was also a particular ambition for her. The way she writes it, she just ended up there. So what was her original goal? What is her career mountain that she wants to work her way to? I don't know what she wants. All I know is what she has and that she isn't entirely happy with it. 
and it's hard because I do understand that to not be respected at your job to be constantly treated like shit sucks but at the same time it sounds like she works four hours a day and makes 20 million dollars a year and that's not horrible also then like leave Exactly. I like, don't know. Just say what you want to say, Kelly. This was such a mixed up mog bog bosh wash. That's the thing is of stories of kind of being like, isn't it funny that we just can't remember my name, but also it's so disrespectful, but also I make a lot of money, but also it's been really good, but also I never left, but also I, like, when am I the senior? Like, so I just, just wish she knew what she wanted. That's the thing is, I know what she doesn't like, but what does she want? Like, what does she want it to be? I honestly don't know. And then the other thing is, a lot of people hate their jobs. A lot, a lot, a lot of people hate their jobs. And a lot of those people do not have the financial stability to just leave those jobs. She has been making $20 million a year for several years now, according to CelebrityNetWorth.com, which I know isn't real. But like, according to that, she has a net worth of $120 million. If you're so miserable there, then stop. I don't know. Something about this book is very all over the place. I hate that she ends it trying to say something because if that is like, what is she saying? OK, so this next chapter is about Botox. She says there's a correlation between the size of her plastic surgeon's house and the amount of time we're required to be on screen. I grew up and I remember feeling like, well, they get Botox and filler and you would do that if you were on TV too because they're being scrutinized all the time and looked at. But there is something interesting about that. We're now all on a screen. Yeah, we're We're all all constantly on camera. And this way that it could go viral at any minute. And even if it doesn't go viral, like you're still on Zoom looking at yourself in the little screen while talking to your boss all the time. You're not just casually looking past a mirror or looking away from it you are constantly confronted with your own image nowadays I think that that is really interesting but this is something that annoys the shit out of me that celebrities say is they think that the way that they're scrutinized is exclusive to them when we are all part of a society that judges appearance enormously she says frankly if I didn't work on camera I'm not sure I would even own a hairbrush much less get Botox but my foray into injectables began innocently enough I respect this point of view. No, I actually don't respect this point of view. I changed my mind because I think that this thing that celebrities do where they're like, well, I'm constantly being scrutinized, so I have to look great. But if I was you regular people, I would be able to just look like shit all the time. Like it completely ignoring that the beauty standard permeates into every walk of life. Everyone is subject to these standards. There is a fuck ton of research on it. Just because you're not being judged by the world, just because you're not being judged by 3 million Instagram followers and tabloids, doesn't mean you don't feel physically judged by tons of people all the time in everyday life. So this idea that like you would just not even brush your hair is silly. And I feel like it's diminishing to people's experience. I also just find it dishonest because she goes, I never get dressed up unless I'm being seen something. And that does happen to be every single day. So I do put on makeup every single day. And I'm like, okay, exactly. Mila Kunis, that bitch does not put on makeup unless she has to. (laughs) Something I do want to give Kelly Ripa credit for is she was one of the first celebrities who admitted to Botox and was very out and open about it. Yeah. So she talks about it. And I I mean, I like this because people had been speculating about her getting Botox for years. And so when she finally got it, she went on live the next day and was like, I got Botox yesterday for the first time. It let me walk you through my entire experience. For whatever reason, the National Enquirer loved to say what she had done to her face. Like, you know, this changed, that changed, this injectable, this fat filler. And she said when they stopped running those tabloids, she was like, oh, my God, do I look so shitty that they can't even pretend that I've gotten work done because nobody would believe it. And that's when she was like, maybe I need to get work done. So it started out with she got armpit Botox because she says she's a sweaty person and it's fine to be sweaty. But if you are speaking live on camera every single day under the hot lights, you're going to sweat a lot. So she starts with that at Dr. Brandt's. And then one year later, she goes back in and is like, I think I'm ready for regular Botox. So she goes for a consultation to get fat transfer. And they're like, you don't have enough fat for us to transfer anywhere. And she's like sad about it. She's like, they said I was too skinny. And then they said the only place you have enough fat is your flanks, but it's not even enough. And she's like, what are flanks? To console herself, she goes out and she gets one Reese's cup and a Snickers and eats half of each. Then she's like, I hadn't had one of these in 10 years. Like, what are you saying to me right now? A handful of these chapters feel very like I'm insecure, but I'm still better than you. And I know that's not what she's saying, but that is like kind of what comes out. So I don't think she's saying that, but I think she is. She is skinnier than all of us. Right. And so she can't get up there and be like, I got fat transferred. The truth of the matter is she is so fucking skinny that there's no fat anywhere. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think she's purposefully saying that, but I think that is what is coming across. And I think that anyone with like a modicum of self-awareness wouldn't have said it. It's hard to be self-deprecating when you have in Everything. society's eyes like won a lot of the games. Right. And that's the problem with this book. And I think it plays on TV because there is this understanding on TV. We suspend our disbelief. You're saying it from the TV. We can't deny that you're on TV. So like and you're next to celebrities. I think when you're the relatable one next to a George Clooney, whoever that George Clooney may be. Whichever George Clooney happens to be on set that day. You are more relatable than him. 
However, on a book when it's just you and me and my couch and you're talking to me about how you can't get a fat transfer because you're too skinny and you haven't had a Reese's cup in 10 years and this is your one indulgence. I'm like, okay, couldn't be me, but okay. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, I agree. And then she talks about how she someday might get a neck lift. And then later in the book, I think she does. I love a book that grows. She does have this funny line though about when she's asking Mark what he thinks about her getting this fat transfer. He's like, well, don't do it for me. I think you're perfect as you are. And she's like, why do men think we do any of this for them? We do this for the internalized patriarchy, not the (laughs) literal patriarchy we sleep next to every day. Amen, sister. She doesn't say it that funny and clever, but that's what she's getting at. And then she goes on to be like, when she comes back and says she can't get the fat transfer, she's like, I went to see about that procedure and they said I couldn't get it. And he's like, why? You're not old enough. And she's like, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? And so now she's like, can you believe that I have no fat on my body? It turns out I have flanks and my husband thinks I wanted a facelift. And I'm like, I guess I get it, man. I don't know. I don't know. It feels like Kelly, you're doing pretty good for yourself. You're doing okay. As Mark would say, you have three healthy children and a husband who loves you. And $20 million and no body fat. What do you want from me? Then she talks about going to the White House Correspondence Dinner. And this is a real, like, we're invited to the White House Correspondence Dinner, but we can't do anything right. Ack! And it's just a chapter about how hard it was to get ready for this event. This is when I said, oh, Kelly Rippa is an Amanda Bynes character. Yes. She's like that goofy, silly girl who tripped at a fashion show and is looking around and feeling silly. And I was ah! on a private plane and I thought that the potpourri was chips. <laughs> yeah. Bop, 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 bop. <laughs> it's funny when it's in TV and movies, but when you're really trying to write a book being like, I'm just like you my tampon fell out of my purse at the white house correspondence dinner i'm the least famous person at my table and in this one she keeps on calling out that mark will always be like well you have three healthy kids and a husband who loves you and she's like why can't i have three healthy kids and a husband who loves me and proper hair and makeup and i'm like that is true but also i mean i don't i didn't walk away mad i didn't walk away mad but i was like this is for the dinner party yeah this is for the other people who are at the white house correspondence dinner to be like you will never believe what it took us to get in the door my tampon fell out i guess i do think if this book had been written all just funny anecdotes name droppy anecdotes from somebody who ended up more famous than she meant to be that could have been the tone i think if she had told this white house correspondence dinner story like this is name droppy this is famous i am famous It's a hard line to walk. She doesn't walk it. Nobody walks it. I mean, Jennifer Lawrence had it for a minute. Like, it is the impossible task. Yes. And then she has a weird chapter about how she doesn't think that she and Mark will ever go to couples therapy. I don't really understand this chapter, honestly. So they went to couples therapy twice, but both times Mark thought that she had gotten to the therapist somehow and manipulated them into taking her side on everything. So then they never went back. Even though she picked the first one and he picked the second one. Yeah. I will say she has a funny analysis of what's wrong with both of them. She goes, Mark has acknowledged that a lot of his own obsessive compulsive behavior was passed on to him from a certain family member who shall remain nameless, has probably given it to our own children. I won't say which ones, but they are the boys. I question whether or not any of my high functioning social anxiety, my low functioning borderline personality disorder, my want and reckless agoraphobia, my unchecked egomaniacal grandiosity, my narcissism that has not progressed to malignancy, or my probable undiagnosed ADHD has affected my kids. But they seem to be doing great. Don't you think so? What was I saying? Where were we? Sorry, I got distracted by my own reflection in the spoon. So I do think that that was like funny and interesting. I guess I don't want relationship advice at all from Kelly Ripa. The way she talks about their relationship, I do believe that they love each other and that they will make it work no matter what. I don't know. I kind of think relationship advice in general needs to go because all the couples that are making it work, I'm like, you found what works for you two as a couple. Yeah. Unless you are a professional, unless you are Esther Perel's or yeah, or La Girl Neck from Couples Therapy, like I don't want to know what you guys are okay with because it's very specific to your childhood trauma. Yeah. She's like, as a couple, her and Mark believe that a vow renewal is like a precursor to divorce. I actually agree with that. That is true. Do you not think that's true? I guess I don't think it's untrue, but I think that like in a situation like her and Mark, I'm just like, I don't know. You guys like had a random elopement in Vegas. I feel like having like a 10 year celebration of marriage, like would have been fine. Yeah, but you don't watch reality TV. If a celebrity does a vow renewal, it means they're about to get divorced. She does say if you're planning to a vow renewal while reading this, I'm sure you'll be fine. So don't cancel on the DJ because I weighed in. I'm clearly jaded and judgmental. I have no idea what I'm talking about. This is not, I repeat, not a self-help book. And then she just talks about finding out via therapy that she hates her job and she doesn't have depression. She just has workplace apathy. She wasn't wrong. At the time, a different time, a pre-me too, time's up time, a pre-woman belonging in the room where decisions are being made time, I was miserable. Suffice to say, I left the office that day without a prescription, but with some breathing techniques for when shit really hits the fan. And then she ends the chapter by being like, also, me and Mark are going to go to couples therapy. 
So she talks about how she went to therapy for 10 years. When she was 39 years old, she started going and she went every week for 10 years. And then finally he was like, I think we should go to couples therapy. And she's like, no, I've already done the work. I'm not fucking going again. And then because she kept saying no, he was like, but we have to. And then he went by himself and she didn't show up. And he's like, the doctor was really surprised you didn't show up. And she was like, why? I told you I wasn't going. And now she's like, I think I've reversed psychology to him too hard. And like, I forgot what the point was. So we may end up going. <laughs> then we get to Claire's favorite chapter about Jack Nicholson. No, Jack Nicholson is not a George Clooney. Okay. That is wrong. I was just naming old guys. That's a different type. That's a psychopath. That's a Jack Nicholson and Robert De Niro to me are the same. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. An Oscar nominated old timey classics guy who fucked everybody and kind of freaks you out and is not conventionally hot. Okay. That's so different. Okay. So she is at a party in the Hamptons, Angelica Houston's party. It's being thrown at Jane and Jimmy Buffett's house. And I'm just going to tell the story real quick. She's there with her friends, Andy Cohen and her husband and... There's a buffet and she picks up the plate for her husband, brings it to him. And there's nowhere to sit with Andy and her husband and the people she knows. So she has to go and sit next to the only available seat in the whole picnic area left, which is Richard Gere. So she's sitting there and she's completely awestruck and she's like obsessed with him and she doesn't know what to do. And she's blabbing and she goes from being too quiet to too loud. She's trying to engage herself. He's being polite and handsome and sweet. And in the middle of them talking, she hears somebody hit the deck. And they run over and Richard Gere is like, somebody call the paramedics. And, and Mark Consuelos is like, should we go home? And, and Kelly's like, we're doing something. Richard is saving a life. Get out of here. So Mark leaves and Richard and Kelly are like cradling this woman who's passed out. And finally, Mark calls the paramedics and he's like, 911 is on the phone. How old are you to the older woman? And Kelly Ripa goes, you can't ask her that. <laughs> and Richard Gere goes, how old are you? And she's like, I'm 40. And he's like, no, 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 the lady on the ground. And so she gives her age or whatever. And they're cradling her. And Mark keeps being like, let's go, let's go. And she's like, I'm here. I'm helping Richard Gere. And the woman gets saved. It turns out she had taken an edible and like hit the ground, whatever. But she goes on live the next day and tells the story. Everyone for months, all summer, she's telling everybody the story about how her and Richard Gere saved this woman's life. And if he's ever in a movie where he's a doctor, she'll be the nurse. And something incredible has happened. And she was so awestruck and she loves him so much. Then a couple months later, oh, yeah. she sees Richard Gere and she's like, oh my God, Richard Gere, it's me, Kelly Ripa. Do you remember when we saved that woman's life? And he goes, you were there. And Mark overhears the whole thing and laughs in her face and brings it up to everyone who will ever hear it. And, and it's like the story that of her lifetime was that she and Richard Gere saved a life and Richard Gere does not remember that Kelly Ripa was there. But then she was at her plastic surgeon's funeral and a woman comes up to her and is like, Kelly Ripa, you were there when I passed out at Angelica Houston's house and you helped save me. And she goes, oh, my God, me and Richard Gere. And she goes, he was there. And that's how the story ends. And I think that that is the one perfect cute story. That's Kelly, it. that's a funny story. That's what I wish this whole book had been. And then she also has another thing that she keeps doing that you can tell she gets a lot of laughs doing IRL. And that's when whenever she talks about her boobs, she refers to them as 32 double A longs. This is also she says, I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating that when we are together, Mark is always the one who gets recognized, not me. And she says it's because of Riverdale. And I do believe that they have like insane fans. I think we nailed it. More people would recognize Kelly, but more people who recognize Mark want something. There's a chapter about getting her neck done and how she like takes Tylenol for it. And she's like, I was so high out of my mind. Throughout the Zoom calls, I kept putting my thing higher and then I finally got the neck done. And then I think the thing that threw me off is it ends with her getting an award from Anderson Cooper for her gay rights initiatives. And I was like, what? <laughs> what did this have to do with anything? <laughs> it was very all over the place. I think she needs to quit that job and take 10 years and wait out any NDAs and then, and then, and then write story. the real book. Because that's what the story is about. It's about what it's like to have these golden handcuffs and be trapped somewhere where you are constantly being disrespected and treated like shit, but you also have the dream life. To be like, I'm more than just a bubbly crowd pleaser. And then it's like, tell me then. Or she needs to write the story, like the Katie Couric story of every famous person she's ever met in the Goofy stories. A very Kathy Griffin-esque. Yeah. Kathy Griffin does walk that line of being like, I'm one of you, but I'm among them. That's the perspective. You have to have the yeah. Nick Carraway or whatever perspective of outsider in. I don't think she pulls it off here because she is so in that she doesn't remember what's normal and what's not. Overall, it, like it, you like her. She's likable. It speeds through, except it for the last chapter about the kids. We obviously like point out the flaws because we're here to like talk about the ins and outs of the book. It is like an enjoyable read, but it, it's like also nothing. You don't walk away being like Kelly. You walk away being like Kelly. <laughs> I don't think she has the distance yet. This very much feels like something that was on her bucket list and then the pandemic hit and she was like, oh, I have the time. But I don't know if it was a book for now. Maybe she hoped this book would be a huge smash success like Jessica Simpson or Mariah Carey 
I'm gonna give her a second act. Maybe she hopes this would be her lily pad out of there. Yeah, because she does say stuff like, if I had known what I know now, I wouldn't have taken this job. And I'm like, that is a crazy thing to say about a job that you're currently at. Yeah, I don't think she has the conviction yet that would have made this a great book. I liked her. No hate. Good job. God, I would love to be Kelly. That was my dream growing up was to be Kelly Kelly Ripa on that show. To this day, I would take that. Anyway, thanks, Kel. You guys, don't forget to get your tickets. Last time, all of our cities sold out pretty quickly, so I would get tickets ASAP. We're so excited to see you. Check out the merch. Yeah, it's like a pre-sale order, and then they only order what was sold and then like a couple extras. So once something goes off the line, it's pretty much kaput. So get it while the drop is hot. We love you so much. Thank you for listening. We'll see you on the Patreon on Thursday. Oh my God, enjoying the Geneva to chat with other worms. Okay, Bye. that's all. Oh, and thank you to our five-star reviewing wormies, my favorite wormies. Thank you, Alice TM. I'll thank you today and I'll thank you tomorrow. Thank you, L Hub. You are the fucking center of the wheel that keeps us turning. Thank you, Not For Kids. Listen, not for me either, but maybe someday we'll make a bleeped version for them. Thank you you Joni Boney hell yeah baby get those bones thank you I message fame loser you're not a loser to me thank you that girl Logan you know what I have another friend who's a girl named Logan and that is a really good girl name thank you Diana you Tex hell yeah go Texas thank you oh wait I forgot that we hate Texas right now but we like Diana thank you Saint Fanny Ooh, shake that Fanny thank you Lil Big Head you know we love a little big head around here. Thanks, Halls Balls. Tis the season to be Hallsy. Thank you, Hannah on the hunt. I hope you find whatever you're hunting for. Let me know if I can help. Thank you, Social Cult. I would join your cult. Thank you, Tuesday Sweeney, my favorite Sweenster. Thanks, Nyan Cat Amazing. You sound like an incredible cat. Thank you, Nadia Balboa. You and Rocky are my heroes. And that is all for this week. Thank you guys so much.